Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We live in a day in which distinctions and borders and boundaries are all taken down. And we see that in the national discussion about open or closed borders. We see it in the move to break down the boundaries between genders. We see it in the removal of distinctions between religions and even among those who claim or not claim to be Christians. Jesus will have none of that. Distinctions matter. Boundaries exist whether we recognize them or not. And these important ideas mark the true from the false. The Sermon on the Mount has been a lot about the genuine versus the counterfeit. Character and conduct of those who are truly in the kingdom of heaven has been described. And the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount is stark and it is striking. It is seamless from what has gone before. The character and conduct that is expected, no, that is demanded of those in the kingdom of heaven is hard. It's downside up. It makes us squirm. But this is not just about a call to some higher spirituality. This is not what the super spiritual do. These are rudimentary, fundamental precepts and principles of the kingdom of heaven. And you don't get to pick and choose what suits you. And here's why. Jesus opens here in these verses with a test of the genuine portals. Jesus draws an absolute distinction between two gates that are leading to two ways that end in two destinations. Enter by the narrow gate. Verse 13, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. I want you to notice as this opens with a command. True disciples are commanded to enter the narrow gate. So we have to ask ourselves, well, what is the narrow gate? Is this about salvation? And if so, in what way? And what is actually being commanded? Is the narrow gate and the hard way about actually going to heaven? And is the wide gate and the easy way actually about going to hell? In the ultimate sense, yes, but also challenge us to think about what discipleship, what being a member of the kingdom of heaven is going to mean. What does it mean to enter the kingdom of heaven? What is the difference between the wide and narrow gates? Now you can speculate above the text about what all these things are, but actually they're answered in the rest of this Sermon on the Mount. For true disciples must enter the narrow gate and they choose it even though they really do know what it will entail. Now, Jesus explains why the narrow gate must be chosen in verses 13 and 14 and it is because of the character of the wide gate. The broad road here is not the road everyone is on. The wide gate is along the way that everyone is going on. Most pictures that you would find on the internet of this are simply wrong. 
They're failing to notice carefully what the text is saying. This wide gate is a turnoff from the main, the common road that all sinners are on. It seems to be leading somewhere great. It's enticing. It's an easy road. And this is why people choose it. It makes few demands. Many, many people are turning into the gate and they're entering this road. And this is the wide gate into easy religion and fake discipleship. This is the road of easy believism. It is maybe a road of even legalism. After all, it's easy to live by lists. And it may be an easy road with a few, a few moral demands, few sins, where everything is accepted, all are included. And no matter what, this gate and its easy way are all about our self-salvation projects. This wide gate and its easy way lead to destruction. Now this may be personal destruction in life, and this may refer to the ultimate end of the Jewish nation, and it more likely refers to the ultimate destruction in an eternal hell. All religions do lead to the same place, just not to God. They lead to hell. It has the same ultimate destination as the road we are all born on as sinners and we all travel on unless we are given grace to enter the narrow gate. True disciples must enter the narrow gate and the hard way. This is a different gate in a much different way. This is not a way crowded with people. It is not a gate that we can see or even enter on our own power. For this is gate is a person. The gate is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I get that from the rest of this text and then from other allusions in the Old and New Testament. The entry to the tabernacle in the Old Testament had one gate. Jesus said he was the gate to the sheepfold. And this was a common way for the Bible and Jesus to speak. There is only one entry into the kingdom of of heaven, and that is through Jesus. I love trifocals, not so much. True disciples enter the narrow gate in the hard way, and the narrow gate in the hard way lead to life, to living. This is not about the ethics of the Sermon on the Mount, or the kingdom, or the new covenant. This is about Jesus and he alone. The gate is narrow because he is the gate. The way is hard because it is the path that Jesus walked, being and doing what the Sermon on the Mount details, the choices to please the Father, to live with kingdom people, to suffer hardship, to take up the cross, to be willing to die, knowing that all along this hard way, and at the end of the way is true life. This is true living. And what is the consequence in verse 14? Not many find it. For it is for true disciples. It is for those that God has chosen. It is available to you if you will see and enter through faith. And frankly, Jesus came to ultimately destroy religion. For religion is about what we do to be accepted by God. The kingdom of heaven is about what Jesus has done to bring us to God. It will not be the popular way. It will not be the popular gate. Few enter the narrow gate and the hard way. And this flies in the face 
of the so-called popularity of Christianity at times, when people are rushing into decisions for Jesus to have their lives improved, to be all they can be, to have their next best life, you are not looking at biblical Christianity. I don't mean to be hard or cynical. But the evidence is, all through the Bible and all through church history, that the more inclusive the institutional church is, the more it will be filled with sinners who are actually headed to hell. It becomes the wide gate and the easy way leading to destruction. And Jesus is going to lay that out for us in just a moment. But in verses 15 to 20, we notice that the wide gate and the broad way have its prophets. It has its preachers. And so here is a test for the false prophets. And Jesus warns us to be alert to these false prophets and false preachers. Now, now I want you to notice this is flowing. These are not little pieces standing alone. If there's two ways, and if there is a broad way and a, and a wide gate, then there are the preachers, the prophets, the teachers of the broad way. And here they are. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. And you're going to recognize them by their fruits, for grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and is thrown and to the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruit. Now, Jesus first warns about the true nature of these false prophets in verse 15. The principle may be applied more broadly, but the warning is ever more needed now. But in this context, Jesus is particularly warning about the prophets, the preachers of the wide gate and the broad and easy way. And they are dangerous because they are deceitful. They look like sheep on the outside, but they are dangerous, ravening wolves on the inside. They seem to be a part of us. They seem to be harmless. Most of them are really nice people. But they will tear you apart. They come with their smiling face, their eloquent and winsome speech, and even kingdom words and deeds. They are wolves, and they will ruin you. And brothers and sisters, there are prophet, they are the prophets of the wide gate and the broad way. Don't be deceived by them. Don't become wolf bait. There's a test for their authenticity in verses 16 through 18. How can you tell sheep preachers from wolf preachers? No, Jesus changes the metaphor so that it will be very clear. You will be able to tell them by their fruits. You will be able to tell them by what they produce. Fruit is produced in according first to the kind of tree it is. At the end of the day, it's impossible for false prophets to produce true virtue over time. They are the wrong kind of tree, and therefore they will not produce the right kind of fruit. True preachers and prophets of the narrow gate and the narrow way will produce the good fruit that a true disciple will produce. And secondly, Jesus points out that fruit is produced in accordance with the condition of the tree. A diseased tree will produce diseased fruit. In this case, Jesus is indicating the fruit of their prophesying, their teaching. Wide gate and broad, easy way teaching. Poison the teaching and preaching. It produces religion. And religiosity. 
and soon condemns people to hell. Well, does this mean that we wait to, well, see at how it all works out? Absolutely not. When we have identified the wolf and the disease tree, we must deal with it. Verse 19, Jesus indicates the response to their falseness. The disease tree is not allowed to stand. For the good of grove, it is cut down. For the good of the orchard, it is burned. For the good of all, its fruit is destroyed as well. And Jesus often uses the metaphor of taking branches and trees and putting them in the fire. And there is a temporal, right now, aspect to that. There is also an eschatological, an end of days aspect to that. For there will come a day when all wolves and all false prophets and all preachers of the wide gate and the easy way will end where the road they preach ends in eternal destruction. And so there's the underlying principle then of how to determine their authenticity. Verse 20. See, it's right to evaluate prophets and preachers and teachers by their fruit, by what their lives, and ultimately what their teaching produces. All through the New Testament, warnings abound that are based on this principle. And just as in the early church, a church now is filled with false teaching and false teachers. And of course, no one is taking them out and burning them at the stake. That was never the right thing to do in the new covenant age. But we will, with careful courage and deep love for you, pull the false sheep's wool off of wolves and expose the diseased tree for who and what it truly is. So there's two ways, two gates and two ways and two destinations. One of religion and one of Christ. But then there are the preachers, the prophets, the teachers of the wide gate and the broad way. But if there is a wide gate and an easy broad way and with its sheep and wolves closed preachers, then how do we think about our profession of faith? It's interesting how Jesus now moves to a test of a genuine profession. In verses 21 to 23. So it's not out there. It's not about them. Now it suddenly becomes about you. Me. And up to this point, we could agree and nod and say, yes, I know people like that, and I know preachers like that. But now, what about those who are misled and deceived? Jesus warns about how easy it is to be self-deceived, to base your entry into and membership of God's kingdom on the wrong things. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father is in heaven. On that day... Many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? There they are. And cast out demons in your name? Really? And do mighty works, word here, miracles in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Verse 21 is a striking principle. It's simple, it's clean, and it's frightening. Not everyone who publicly says that Jesus is Lord enters the kingdom of heaven. What you say must be matched by what you do. Lord, Lord are empty words if there's no doing the will of God. That's not hard to understand, but it is the danger of the wide gate and the broad way. For there's no real call in the easy way to do the will of God. After all, it is easy and without cost and without compelling obedience. That is the very point of that way. 
So this leads me to a simple question. Does your profession of faith of Christ as Lord actually result in obedience to Christ the Lord? Or will you be among these? In verse 22. There's going to come a day when even deeds will not suffice. And look at their horrified protest. It begins with, Lord, Lord, they did mighty deeds. They are saying that in their view, they did the will of God. They were able to prophesy. They were able to cast out demons. They were able to do wondrous miracles all through the name of Jesus. They did what the disciples did. They did what the apostles did. And what many in Christianity do today. But that is not and never will be the definitive proof of a genuine profession. It can all be faked. It can all be empowered by the evil one and even be allowed by God himself. And notice that there will be many who say this. This is no small subgroup of a few down through thousands of years. There are a lot of people who choose the wide gate and the easy way and were confirmed that they were fine with their words and deeds. Yet on the last day, they're in front of the judge and that says it all. The road to destruction goes through the great white throne judgment. And on that road are many people saying, Lord, Lord, oh, what am I doing here? And I did all kinds of powerful things in Jesus' name. But there's a final pronouncement in verse 23. And that final pronouncement sends them to their doom. Depart. They are workers of lawlessness. Doing these things is not a sign of doing God's will. Even doing powerful miracles in Jesus' name can be deeds of evil if you're not a true Christian. I know there are lots of questions. And we cannot address them or answer them all today. But it is quite clear that Jesus says that sinners can and will do miracles in Jesus' name. I don't know how else to take this text. That's shocking. Think of the deception. Think of the level of self-deception that would ensue. And these are false prophets. These are the wolves in sheep's clothing. But maybe this could also be you. What is the difference? On what basis are these false professions, professors sent away? It's interesting. Jesus says... I never knew you. They are not among his family. He has not enrolled them in the kingdom of heaven. You see, it's not ultimately whether you know Jesus or not. It is ultimately whether Jesus knows you. God is always the one who takes the initiative. Your belief is a response to God's moving first in your heart. The Lord knows his own. They are enabled to see and to enter the narrow gate and the hard way. But you are still responsible. And it is not for us to argue about all of this. Because brothers and sisters, it's simply the way it is. And the way the Bible has revealed it to be. Jesus commands all, enter the narrow gate. And all those who are known by Jesus, see it and enter it. Now we come to the conclusion of Jesus' sermon. Here is the test of a genuine foundation. Verses 24 to 27. And Jesus distinguishes between two builders and two foundations and two results. Verse 24, everyone then, do you hear that? Everyone then, there's a connection. It, everyone, 
Do you see, following, following what I just said, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and it beat on that house, but it did not fail, fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Such a simple illustration. There's no mistaking what Jesus says. He speaks first of building on the rock. Hearing and doing God's word, Jesus' words, is the foundation. It is the rock. If you build your assurance of faith in Jesus on hearing and doing his words, then the house of your Christian life will stand through any storm. Your profession of faith, pardon the pun, will be rock solid. Will not falter. Will not fail. It will sustain you to the end. But once again, we are confronted with say and do. Don't build your house of faith on anything but your willingness to do the will of God that is revealed in the Word of God. But there is an, another builder who builds his house on the sand of just hearing and not on the rock of hearing and doing. And storms will come and that house will fall and the profession of faith will crumble, his profession is false. And his assurance is false and misguided, foolish and misguided. So what are then these words? Well, in the immediate context, what can they be but the words of Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount? And I want you to understand something. If you think you have entered by the narrow gate and you are unwilling to do the will of God shown through you in Matthew 5 to 7, then your profession of faith is not on solid ground. And Jesus lays this out just as clear as it can be. And this is meant to challenge you. Jesus means for you to tremble just a bit. I wonder how Judas Iscariot heard this. In our postmodern and relativistic and plural culture, how can Christians justify this kind of exclusivism? Seems to sound to many to be, well, arrogant. Well, we're not defending a religion called Christianity. <laughs> it is often just indefensible. Dietrich Bonhoeffer reminds us that Jesus Christ came to destroy religion. For religion is human self-salvation projects. And even the Christian religion is a cardboard shack on a broad way. Michael Green writes, quote, It will not keep out the wind and the hail. What Jesus offers is totally different. It begins not from our reaching up, but from God reaching down. It is not a religion at all, but a revelation and a rescue. Jesus is the revelation of what God is like, and never has there been such a true likeness. The King has come to bring in the kingdom. He is no less than God's rescue for men and women lost in their selfdom and sin. So we do not claim ultimacy for Christianology. We do claim absolute and total supremacy of Jesus Christ. End quote. Well, we must build on the rock. How do we do that? Jesus' reply to that question is the heart of what the Bible teaches. We must hear and obey. Not just hear, but also obey. Theological world and religious worlds are full of hearing. It is overloaded with God talk. What will thrill the heart of God? 
and make pagans realize the gospel is true, is a practical and generous obedience, obedience that transforms us in every sphere that Jesus taught in the mountain sermon. This is what marks disciples who follow him. This is the kingdom manifesto detailed with immense authority. This is the narrow gate of Christ and the hard way of a cross kind of discipleship. And Jesus closes in this way to call you and to challenge you. Too many of you have chosen the wide gate and the easy way of religion. You have listened to wolves in sheep's clothing. You are not doing what you are hearing from God's word. Be warned. The day of reckoning is coming. So what should you do? Cast yourself on the mercy of God. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. Go through the narrow gate and walk the hard way of discipleship. And all along, you will have life. And you will have life until the day when you enter into the fullness of that life. Enter the narrow gate that leads to life. Father, I take these words, and maybe this a little bit difficult sermon to hear, and I pray that you would impress it upon our hearts. Father, maybe there are people sitting here today who realize that they are on the way of religion. They're depending on some decision they made for Jesus, and they are simply unwilling to do what you say. Grant, Father, this morning eyes to see. Grant to them saving faith that they might believe. Grant to them regeneration that they might live and enter the gate. And may all of us in our own professions of faith rest them on the solid foundation of Jesus Christ and doing his will. We pray this for our great good and all for your great glory.